Hi there and welcome to The Daily Gardener, a podcast about gardening, botanical history, and literature. I'm your host, Jennifer E. Blaine, and today is October 4th. Today in botanical history, we'll celebrate an English artist and clergyman, an old diary entry from the great Henry David Thoreau, and we'll also learn about an American publishing tycoon and his family's retreat called Bird Haven Farm. We'll hear an excerpt on October from a Harry Potter book, and we grow that garden library today with a book from one of the great plantsmen of our time, and this is his excellent resource on viburnums. And then we'll wrap things up with a charming garden verse. In fact, I bet that you've heard it before, but you may not be familiar with the woman who wrote it. Well, can you believe that we are already into October? You know, when we head into a new month, at the end of a week, sometimes it takes my brain a little bit of time to catch up. In fact, it's so much easier for me to get in sync with a new month when it starts on a Monday instead of a Friday, because here we are, it's a Monday, and it's already the 4th of October. So anyway, this weekend, I spent time playing catch up, getting in sync with October, and as I was going through my little October file that's filled with all the little snippets of information that I collect during the year that I want to share with you during this month, I stumbled on this cute little poem, and I think I might have shared it with you last year, but it's a quick one, and it's by Rainbow Rowell, and I think it's a little play on Merry Christmas, because the poem is called Merry October. Anyway, I love this poem for October, and I've saved it because it calls to mind all of this autumn imagery. So here it is, Merry October. October, baptize me with leaves, swaddle me in corduroy, and nurse me with split pea soup. October, tuck tiny candy bars in my pockets and carve my smile into a thousand pumpkins. Isn't that great? Well, we are all on the clock now as far as our garden projects are concerned. Winter is coming, as they say in Game of Thrones, and so we just don't have that much time, especially up here in Minnesota, to get things done in the garden. I figure up at the cabin I have until Halloween, if I'm lucky, and then it just don't be too cold to be outside. But I have a few things that I want to get done. I ordered some rolls of burlap because I want to put skirting around my potting bench that I set up outside. Last summer on Facebook Marketplace, someone had built some seating for the fire pit. So when I was there getting this seating, I noticed that they had this wooden lounge chair that they had created. It even had wheels on one end of it, so it was great to cart around. But what I found that I needed, even more than a lounge chair, was a potting station. So I have my potting bench where I keep all of my pots and my tools and things like that, but I wanted a big, long, like eight foot long table that was filled with soil that I could use when I was potting up plants. And so what we did is we tipped this lounge chair upside down. We made sure that that it wouldn't flop open, so it got screwed into place. And I think we added a few extra support beams across, if I'm remembering correctly. And then I just lined it with landscape fabric. Oh, and you know what? For legs, now I'm remembering this, we decided to go the super cheap route, the super easy route, and we went with metal sawhorses. So now you know the reason I want to skirt it with burlap. It's primarily to hide those metal sawhorses. I love how functional they are, but I don't like the look. And also it will help me screen and kind of provide some privacy for the buckets and the pails and the little garden benches that I store underneath this big long potting bench. So now I need to distinguish between these two things. So I guess I have my long potting bench and then I have my potting station. I don't know, is that what we're gonna call it now? 
Well, in any case, this is just one of the little projects that I wanna get done before the snow flies. It'll be pretty simple to do. I'll just be using a staple gun and my burlap and maybe I'll really gussy it up with some ribbon. We'll see, we'll see what I get done. But that's something that I'm hoping to get done tomorrow while I'm spending time at the cabin. And then as for the fire pit and this big long gravel path that we're working on, oh my goodness, these projects might be getting the best of us, even with the gator and even with all of us working together on it. I think we might just be running out of time. So I'm going to be making some calls to some local contractors and putting out the word on Nextdoor. We'll see if we can get some help to accelerate this process. I wanna to try to get it done this fall so that it's ready to go for the graduation party for my son in the spring. So there you go. Definitely feeling the push as we're heading into fall. I am with you in the struggle. All right, it's time for today's curated news. All right, today's curated news comes to us from Fine Gardening. The title of the article is called Improve Your Soil by Raking Less. And I picked this article from something that my son asked me today when I was leaving the cabin. He said, hey, what do you want me to do with these leaves? Should I blow them into this bed? Do you want me to put things over here? And I loved that he was aware of how I like to use leaves on the property. Now, of course, this has taken years of me talking to the kids about how we use leaves on the property, but it's really gratifying to hear them say it back to you as they become young adults, isn't it? It's wonderful. Anyway, this post by Fine Gardening was written by Terry Ettinger, and he makes a great point here, which is if you mow your leaves into your lawn, you can improve the vigor of your lawn, and you can also use unraked leaves in planting beds because of course it makes your perennials happy. Now I know for new gardeners or first time homeowners or young adults or maybe even some older adults, this can be a new way of doing things. Instead of putting your leaves in a bag at the end of your driveway, you're using them on your property. You're not letting that fertilizer and that blanket of protection leave your property. But you know, this isn't rocket science. And in fact, as I was going through some old newspaper articles, I stumbled on an article, I think it was from 1952, and they were giving this exact same advice. So that message, that little drumbeat of using leaves in the garden, well, that message is still one that needs to get to homeowners and gardeners and the like. Now, if you're looking for a personal testimonial about the benefits of using leaves on your property, or you want to get new ideas about how you can use leaves on your property, you can go ahead and read this piece by Terry and see all of the neat ways that he uses leaves on his property. And of course, you can find that over in the Facebook group for the show. I make it very easy for you to find all of the articles that I reference on the podcast. So the title of this article is improve your soil by raking less. So search for the word soil and Terry's post will pop up. And of course, if you're not in the Facebook group, you have a standing invitation. You can join at any time. Might be a good thing for you to consider as we head into winter. If you're looking to enjoy some camaraderie with other gardeners, you can find it there in the group. And to join, all you need to do is head on up to the top of the search bar in Facebook where you'd search for a friend and type in the words Daily Gardener Community and then request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. It's time for today's botanical history. Here's botanical history for this day, October 4th. It was on this day, October 4th, in 1761 or 1762, depending on the document that you're looking at, that William Gilpin, the English artist, teacher, clergyman, and landscape designer, was born. Now, William is the man who coined the term picturesque. 
And how that came about is that he had taken a trip. He had visited a little town called Ross, and he put together all of his thoughts on this trip into a book. And the book became England's first unofficial travel guide. William inspired people to come and enjoy the sights of the town, including the picturesque Y River, and visitors came to the area in droves. Now, when William wasn't traveling, he spent a great deal of time outdoors painting landscapes, and he once observed, every distant horizon promises something new. And with this pleasing expectation, we follow nature through all her walks. During his life, many looked to William as an arbiter of artistic taste. In addition to the picturesque landscape, he was especially fond of old ruins, mountains, and trees. William's paintings were created on site, out in nature, and he wasn't opposed to using a little artistic license to make the scene even more compelling, adding more trees, a little bridge here and there, or enhancing an old ruin. In 1786, William wrote, a ruin is a sacred thing rooted for ages in the soil, assimilated to it, and become, as it were, a part of it. William was the first president of the Royal Watercolor Society, and he also authored several books related to his work as an artist. One of his more popular books was called Forest Scenery, which featured 45 watercolors of trees and shrubs, along with descriptions. He also included his tips and tricks for capturing a picturesque effect on canvas through the clumping of trees, this unique skill that he developed. Tree painting was a William Gilpin specialty, and he adored trees. In fact, one time he wrote, It's no exaggerated praise to call a tree the grandest and most beautiful of all productions on earth. And it was on this day, October 4th, in 1853, that Henry David Thoreau wrote these words in his journal. The maples are reddening and the birches yellowing. The mouse ear in the shade in the middle of the day looks as if the frost still lay on it while it wears the frost. Bumblebees are on the aster undulatus and gnats are dancing in the air. And today is the birthday of Edward Stratemeyer. He was born on this day in 1862. He was an American publisher, a writer of children's fiction, and the founder of what he liked to call the Stratemeyer Syndicate. He produced over 1,300 books and sold over 500 million copies. He's remembered for his series like The Bobsy Twins and The Hardy Boys. And the very day that his new series, Nancy Drew, was released, he died. Regarding his legacy, Fortune wrote, As oil had its Rockefeller, literature had its Stratemeyer. After Edward died, his widow, Magdalene Van Camp, bought a farm that she called Birdhaven. It was a place that she enjoyed living at on weekends and holidays for more than 40 years. Now, during those four decades, she wrote over half of the Nancy Drew books and developed plots for many other series. Edward and Magdalene's daughter, Harriet, took over the family business and ran it for 50 years. She also spent the last half of her life at Birdhaven, and in 1982, while she was watching The Wizard of Oz for the very first time, she had a heart attack and died. 
Today, the 25 acres known as Birdhaven Farm in Tewkesbury Township is part of the Garden Conservancy Open Day. The barns, outbuildings, and the original 19th century stone house are joined by a contemporary home that was built in the 1990s. And in 2002, the garden was redesigned under the vision of Fernando Caruncho as a medieval village. The property boasts mature trees, an apple orchard, fruit trees, and a vegetable and herb garden, along with hay meadows and a perennial border that was designed by Lisa Stam. Design elements include a woodland walk, cascading ponds, a charming pond hut, a maze for grandchildren, and an elf stump. But there's something else happening at Birdhaven Farm. The current owner, Janet Mavick, is finding inspiration in the flora and fauna, and she created her own line of whimsical jewelry. One day, as she was working in the garden, she was thinking about jewelry and was suddenly struck with the idea of making jewelry inspired by her vegetables. And I have to say that I've seen her beans that she uses for necklaces and for earrings, and they are so cool. And I also shared a video in the Facebook group of the designer that she used to help at Birdhaven Farm, the one that helped make it look like a medieval village. And then I also shared this great video that Janet put together where she was talking about her farm and the inspiration that she finds there, and then her work putting together all of this beautiful jewelry. So you've got to check that out the next time you're in the group. But in that video where Janet is taking us on a little tour of Birdhaven Farm, she said this about her jewelry. She said, I only make things that I either grow here myself or they swim or they fly in. I love that. Janet's jewelry is made with brass and then dipped in 18 karat gold, sterling silver, or gunmetal. Janet hopes that her jewelry clients feel a closeness to nature with her unique jewelry designs. It's time for today's Unearthed Words. Today's Unearthed Words come to us from J.K. Rowling. This is from her book, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets. October arrived, spreading a damp chill over the grounds and into the castle. Madame Pomfrey, the nurse, was kept busy by a sudden spate of colds among the staff and students. Raindrops the size of bullets thundered on the castle windows for days on end. The lake rose, the flower beds turned into muddy streams, and Hagrid's pumpkins swelled to the size of garden sheds. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, Viburnums by Michael A. Durr. This book came out in 2007 and the subtitle is Flowering Shrubs for Every Season. In this book, Michael takes us on an in-depth tour of viburnums, one of the most versatile, most utilized, and beloved shrubs for our gardens. As a woody shrub expert, Michael was the perfect person to write a comprehensive guide on viburnums, and he reveals their robustness and beauty in addition to sharing detailed information about every possible type of viburnum that a gardener could ever desire. His honest and balanced review of every plant will make it easier for you to pick out the perfect viburnum for your garden. Viburnums can easily satisfy 
any landscape need. Some are for season, some are a true wow in the garden, some are well-behaved workhorses, and others play a supporting role in garden design. Whether you want gorgeous fall color, stunning blossoms, fragrance, or fruit, there's a viburnum for every need. And Michael likes to say that a garden without viburnums is like a life without the pleasures of music and art. This book is 276 pages of viburnums in all their glory, spotlighting the diversity in this incredibly functional and beautiful genus. You'll want to bring it along on your next trip to the Garden Center, guaranteed. You can get a copy of Viburnums by Michael A. Durr and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $14. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. It was on this day, October 4th in 1858, that Dorothy Gurney, the English hymn writer and poet, was born. Dorothy wrote the famous wedding hymn, O Perfect Love, for her sister's wedding. Her sister loved the tune of O Strength and Stay, but she wanted different words so that she could use the song during the ceremony. And in a flash of divine inspiration, Dorothy jotted down new lyrics in just 15 minutes, and the result was O Perfect Love. But Dorothy also wrote one of the most charming garden verses ever created, and the words she strung together still grace our gardens, our sundials, our memorials, and our cemeteries. The four lines of simple verse are taken from her original poem called God's Garden, and here they are. The kiss of the sun for pardon, the song of the birds for mirth. One is nearer God's heart in a garden than anywhere else on earth. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Maple Grove and Wyoming, Minnesota. If you want to read today's show notes, just head on over to thedailygardener.org. And while you're there, be sure to sign up for my free Friday newsletter. And don't forget that you have a standing invitation to join the free Facebook group for listeners of the show. Just search for Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. Last but not least, you can always get in touch by emailing me at jennifer at thedailygardener.org. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling, and as always, have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.